Orcas are incredible animals. These massive apex predators swim in every ocean on our planet and have amazingly complex social structures and interactions with one another, and even have their own cultures which are passed down from generation to generation. They sit at the very top of marine food webs, with only people posing a threat to them, and have had a major impact on human cultures around the world throughout history. One of the most fascinating things about orcas is the fact that there are so many differences between different populations of these marine mammals. These are very wide-ranging animals, and so groups that live in different parts of the world would be expected to show differences to each other. But then there are also many differences between populations that live close to one another and even overlap in their ranges. Not only do these killer whale types differ in their diet and behaviours, but also in their languages, social practices, and even in their anatomy and outward appearance. Recent analyses of orca genomes have also shown that these types have many genetic differences too, and in some cases have been reproductively isolated from each other for significant lengths of time. This evidence for divergence between types has therefore prompted some researchers to suggest that there might actually be multiple species of orca alive today or that they are potentially in the process of speciating right before our eyes. The evolution of these remarkable creatures is therefore of great interest, and as orcas are my personal favourite modern animal, I really wanted to do some videos on what we know about their fossil record, and the discussions about the disparity of their modern populations. So let's get into it. First of all, where did orcas come from? For the very beginning of the story, and an overview of cetacean origins and evolution in general, I'd recommend watching my two-part series on whale evolution that I made a few years ago, as there's a lot to cover on their very early evolution. Skipping forward a bit though, these cetaceans are members of the toothed whale lineage, the odontocetes, which first appeared around 34 million years ago. Within the toothed whales, orcas belong to the oceanic dolphin group, technically named Delphinidae. This is why you may have heard people say that the name killer whale is inaccurate as they're actually dolphins, which, yes they are, but dolphin also refers to four other separate lineages of toothed whales as well. The New World River Dolphins, South Asian River Dolphins, the La Plata Dolphin, and the likely extinct Yangtze River Dolphin, or Baiji. Plus, pilot whales are also included within oceanic dolphins, so personally I don't think there's too much point in getting hung up on the names, since all different types of dolphins are just toothed whales themselves. Anyway, Delphinidae probably originated about 11 or 12 million years ago, and they very quickly underwent a radiation as they adapted to fill various niches, giving rise to lineages that are still around today, including bottlenose dolphins, humpback dolphins, pilot whales, false killer whales, and many other species. In fact, Delphinidae is the most diverse of any family of marine mammal, potentially including 37 species, depending on who you ask. However, due to their relatively recent and rapid evolution, the classification and relationships between members of this group have proven to be rather complicated, and many disagreements have arisen over how they are all related. A study published in 2020 might finally have resolved things somewhat, using genetic data and finding a pretty solid and well-supported evolutionary tree that shows orcas are quite basal within delphinids, diverging just after the Atlantic white-sided dolphin lineage. Then, within the delphinids, orcas have been placed within a subfamily called Orsinine. The precise definition of this group and what should be included in it has undergone some changes in more recent years, and whereas older research found that other living delphinids could also be included in Orsinine, such as the false killer whale, pygmy killer whale, melon-headed whale, pilot whales, snubfin dolphins, and Risso's dolphin, evidence from genetic data has found all these species to group together in a different subfamily, Globicephalinae. It therefore seems that orcas are the sole living members of Orsinine. however there are still some extinct species that likely belong to this group. The oldest definite member of the lineage leading to modern orcas is a species named Orsinus sitoniensis. Known from fossils found in Italy and England, it lived between 3.5 to 2.5 million years ago, and was pretty similar in overall skull and vertebral anatomy to the living Orsinus orca. However, Orsinus sitoniensis was notably smaller in size than living killer whales, potentially reaching about 4 meters in length, and also differs in possessing more teeth in the jaws than the modern orca. The feeding habits of this extinct killer whale have been investigated, and it seems that they were mostly eating small and medium-sized fishes, 
and not regularly consuming marine mammals or bigger fish, like in populations of modern orca. Although it has been pointed out that the large, robust teeth of this species would have enabled it to bite and tear at much larger prey if it had wanted. So Orsinus cetoniensis may represent a sort of intermediate feeding ecology between smaller fish-eating dolphins and later macroraptorial killer whales. Another slightly younger species of extinct Orsinus is also known, Orsinus paleoorca. This species is still only known from a single fragment of tooth that was found in Japan and originally described in 1937, and it displays many of the characteristics of orca teeth. It's actually much larger than the teeth of Orsinus cetoniensis, and has been noted to be much more similar in size to modern orcas. And as such, the original describer of the species suggested Paleoorca to be the direct ancestor of modern killer whales. The larger and more robust shape of the tooth may therefore also suggest a shift in diet towards larger prey and a more macroraptorial feeding strategy. Sadly, that's about all we know about the mysterious Orsinus Paleoorca, and it doesn't seem that any more material has since been assigned to this species. There is also another much older potential species within the genus, Orsinus meyeri. However, the validity of this species and its inclusion within the Orsinus genus is debated. This species is only represented by some fragmentary jaws and teeth, and might actually be a kind of extinct sperm whale according to some researchers. Again, not a lot else is really known about Orsinus meyeri, which is a shame, and it seems like a species that could really do with some more study. There are also some other genera of extinct cetaceans that have been included within Orsinonae, including one called Hemisyntraculus. Again, the exact classification of this ancient delphinid has gone back and forth and has been thoroughly disagreed upon ever since it was initially named back in 1873, but it definitely shows some features of modern orca anatomy as well as having similarities to bottlenose dolphins and to the false killer whale. At least three species are known, but a fourth may have existed that is currently unnamed. Two of the species are known from fossils found in Italy, while another is known from Peru in the famous Pisco Formation, which was also home to Megalodon and the giant killer sperm whale Leviathan, and the unnamed species was found in the North Sea. Hemicentraculus was again not quite as large as modern killer whales, reaching lengths of between about 3 to 5 meters. Arimidelphus sorbinii is another extinct species that's been classified as a member of Orsinone. Named in 2005 based on a partial skull and some bones from the body, it was again discovered in Italy in rocks dating to between 3.1 and 2.2 million years ago. Although it was at first thought to be a fossil of an extinct species of bottlenose dolphin, it shows many more similarities with orcas, and probably also went after fairly large prey, as it has a pretty robust mandible and presumably would have employed a powerful bite. Another extinct cetacean genus that has been placed as an orcinine is the utterly bizarre Platalliarostrum hookmani, or Hookman's blunt-snouted dolphin. Named from a fossil found in the North Sea, ranging from the mid-part of the Pliocene Epoch to the early Pleistocene Epoch, this partial skull shows that this delphinid had a very strange anatomy. The specimen comprises the left half of the snout, and shows that there was an unusual lateral protuberance jutting out from the side. The paleontologists describing this specimen are confident that it's not the result of an injury and definitely represents the natural condition for the animal, which therefore must have had a very broad and short snout. The extent of the roughened rugose area of bone on the top surface also suggests that there was a lot of muscle attachment here to hold a particularly large bulbous melon, the large mass of tissue that acts like a sound lens for the vocalizations of toothed whales. The paleontologists therefore interpret the lateral protuberance as providing extra support for this tissue, and reconstructions of Platalia rostrum show this cetacean with an almost comically bulbous forehead, like an even more extreme version of the living pilot whale. The paleontologists also explain that more complete remains of this cetacean are needed in order to properly test its evolutionary relationships, but find that it is very similar to the modern pilot whale genus Globicephala. They also place it within Orsinone, but they're going by a version of Orsinone that includes a lot of other living species, including pilot whales themselves, and that isn't really supported by genetic data. So basically, although you'll often see Platalia rostrum classified as an orsinine since the original authors placed it there, it's potentially much closer to pilot whales and therefore should probably be placed within Globicephalinae. But once I saw the reconstructions of Platalia rostrum, I could not resist at least mentioning it in this video, because, I mean, just look at that thing. 
Another species of extinct toothed whale that has some relevance to killer whale evolution was described in 2022. This whale, named Rhododelphus stamatiodizi, was found in Pleistocene-aged rocks on the island of Rhodes in Greece, dating to between 1.5 and 1.3 million years ago. It's known from a partial skull and some bones from the body, and it was found to be a close relative of the false killer whale, but not particularly close to the orca, which again is found to be the only living member of the once diverse Orsinone. Thanks to the discovery of several fish ear bones with the fossil cetacean, they found that Rhododelphus itself was most likely a predator of medium to large sized fish. The study describing Rhododelphus also examines the tooth size and tooth count of various other delphinids to see how these features relate to their preferred prey and hunting style, and support the interpretation that Orsinus cetoniensis was also a fish eater. They therefore conclude that Rhododelphus and Orsinus cetoniensis both represent sorts of intermediate stages in their relative lineages, leading to modern species that feed on other marine mammals. Certain populations of orcas will of course feed on all sorts of mammalian prey, including very large toothed and baleen whales, and false killer whales are also known to target other delphinids. However, Rhododelphus and Orsinus cetoniensis indicate that these lineages were mainly fish eaters up until relatively recently, and that marine mammal predation was a newer development in delphinid ecomorphology. So basically, the false killer whale and orca lineage seem to have initially evolved their head and jaw morphology as an adaptation for fish hunting, and then when some of them recently switched to hunting marine mammals, they already had jaw and tooth anatomy that was well suited to this type of feeding, a sort of pre-adaptation, technically called an exaptation. So, Rhododelphus is an interesting addition to the known fossil record of orca-like delphinids, and helps to show how exactly the killer whale ecomorph may have first evolved. Anyway, it's apparent then that the fossil record of killer whales is not exactly the most complete or best understood due to the unfortunate relative rarity of good cetacean fossils from marine Pleistocene sediments, and it seems like there is much work to be done on extinct orcinines. Nevertheless, what we do have shows an intriguing evolutionary history. So definitely an area of paleontology to keep an eye on to see what future research might reveal, and I hope we get some more fossil discoveries in the coming years. Now that we've looked at the fossil record of orcas and their more ancient evolution in deep time, what about the evidence for orca evolution from modern populations? Recent genetic studies have revealed a lot about how these animals have diverged from one another in the last few hundreds of thousands of years and some researchers have even called for multiple different species of living killer whales to be officially classified. So in part two of this series we'll be taking a look at the modern day distribution of different orca populations, ecotypes and morphotypes, as well as investigating the genetic studies that have been done on this incredibly wide ranging cetacean to see how they're all related to one another. Part two is probably going to end up being significantly longer than this first part, so bear with me while I work on that, but in the meantime if you'd like some more orca content I would highly recommend checking out the videos that my mum has made over on her channel One World. My mum has a PhD in marine biology and is incredibly passionate about wildlife conservation, and has lots of videos about various conservation stories on her channel. She's recently made a video about the social behaviour of resident orca populations and why the females of these populations are particularly protective and supportive of their male offspring compared to their daughters. And she has many other orca videos too, including ones about the reasons behind the recent encounters between killer whales and yachts, and why this behaviour has been spreading. So please do be sure to head on over and give her your support. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this first part, and I hope you're excited for part two. I'd also like to thank all of our current channel members, and I hope you've been enjoying all the extra content we've put on there so far. Please do consider becoming a member if you would like to support the channel in that way. We've got lots of exciting plans for what we want to do with it, and we're very open to your suggestions for what you'd like to see. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.